This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. This is where we discuss warfighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large-scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, I'm Colonel Matt Hardman, the Commander of Operations Group here at the Joint Readiness Training Center, and thanks for joining us for another episode of The Crucible, the JRTC Experience. And today, we are very fortunate uh, to be joined by somebody that's largely responsible for many of my failings, uh, my coach at LTP, uh, one of my heroes, uh, an awesome uh, soldier, an awesome coach, um, Colonel Retired Mike Kershaw. Sir, would you tell us a little bit about you? Thank you, Colonel Harmon, and thank you for having me here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I've been at LTP. I did 34 years on active duty uh, as an infantry officer, uh, 34 years and eight days, for those of you who count that kind of stuff. Um, I commanded uh, a company, a battalion, and a brigade in combat, a battalion in peace support, uh, peacekeeping operations. I participated in all the CTCs at the time, uh, JOTB in Panama, NTC, uh, JRTC, and then, of course, JRMC or CMTC as we called it uh, as a battalion commander. Um, a combat experience, uh, mechanized company commander and ranger battalion commander in large scale combat ops, direct action, hike, hick, whatever you wanted to call it. A brigade command in a classic coin environment, and then a battalion command in peacekeeping, peace support, and, and contingency operations. Uh, since retiring, I've worked here nine plus years. Uh, 83 rotations, primarily coaching rifle battalion staffs, 70 of them, but I've also coached SF battalions. I've coached three foreign infantry battalions, Canadian and British, and a couple of other here or there brigades uh, on call. Uh, married, three children all out of the house, an empty nester with me and my beautiful wife in San Antonio, Texas. You got some good-looking dogs, and you do a little bit of bird hunting. Uh, there is some <laughs> evidence that I've been conducting bird hunting operations, but we're going to stick to the script here today. Um, and thanks for having me. Sure, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, 2015 would have been August or September 2015 came through, uh, and you were the coach for, for our team, uh, 3509. Um, got a ton out of that experience, uh, applied some of it well. Uh, some of it I got to uh, inform my after action reviews of things I didn't do well um, and, you know, been blessed uh, to, you know, have, have been a beneficiary of your coaching uh, here over the years uh, and still getting your coaching. Um, so you, you've had, you know, I think a unique perspective to get to see uh, units, um, you know, over the years, you know, an informed perspective of your time uh, on active duty and then 70 plus battalions in your time as an LTP coach. You know, what um, what are some of the changes over time that you've seen? Well, particularly, Matt, over the last, I would say, four to five years, the, the shift, obviously, the CTCs, you know, in the Army to, to preparing for large-scale combat operations, and particularly at the battalion level, uh, what we've seen is uh, battalions recognizing, one, that they have to get lighter and more mobile command posts, that the command posts in the past, for whatever reason, we constructed them, and they were probably good reasons at the time, uh, are just probably not survivable in the current operating environment. So uh, I just happen to be coaching a battalion that's a test bed in their division for this, uh, which, of course, no battalion commander wants to be told, you're the test bed for this. All other battalions need to look like you. But So you see these practical things going on, and uh, we try to coach the same battalions. So I see the same battalions every two years. Uh, this battalion also and, and other battalions have developed uh, I've seen a real shift to analog first planning. Not that not that these battalion commanders aren't aware of technology, they are, but they're also aware uh, that it, it can encumber them, slow them down, and make them more detectable. So, particularly in the last four or five years, everybody comes in wanting to make sure their analog products work 
everybody can execute them and then figure out how the digits can help. And then the last thing, and it's another tangible thing that you can see here as a coach. And again, remember my perspective on this is limited to the planning phase here at LTP. I, I don't go out in the box. It's, it's a scary place. You need people like you <laughs> and the great OCTs. This is a plug for the great OCTs of Task Force 3. Right. Who stand between me and the, the chaos in the box. But, but I, obviously I seek their, I get their feedback every rotation. Um, but you see peace ops now that are things that can be taken and from the short as they got smaller, they've become acetated and they become fill in the blank. These things that people can use in the conditions that uh, once the JFE or the initial entry mission, which are largely planning in a similar type environment, hard stand type stuff that you can go to and plan uh, out there in the box. So those are shifts. Uh, that, that have been unmistakable, particularly over the last four or five years. Um, you know, you've you've gotten to watch a lot of reps with planning. You know, what number of units are, are doing this stuff on, on making PowerPoint slides? Uh, almost none now. I mean, that's right. <laughs> that's become the ass. I mean, in my last battalion commander, who I just talked to, I mean, he's he's a, he's a convert. Uh, <laughs> you know, he goes, if you if you're preparing this stuff on a computer, just prepare to be disappointed. Right uh, now, are they building peace ops on PowerPoint, print them and ask? Yeah, that's not. Yeah. But uh, one of the. Um, the, the yeah, the, day, the days of the next slide are... Well, 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 I bet about like one of the frustrations with, uh, you know, wargaming, which is acknowledged as the most difficult task, the ones you can practice the least. And you used to not be able to say wargaming in a classroom. Everybody's laptop went up and Excel spreadsheets came out. And uh, I was an S3 long, long time ago. And I know the value of capturing it. And, and certainly, we, you know, how we can capture digits, use them for... You know, communications, sharing, they, they, they bear, there's a lot of power, you know, in that, but they don't facilitate rapid planning. I haven't yet to see it. And now battalions don't do that. You know, you say war game and they start to realize, hey, we need to, to configure our staff. It's a staff battle drill. It's like battle drill one for a squad, enter clear a room or whatever, battle drill six. Right. They realize, okay, there's a way to war game now that's not, the, the computer is not between us in solving this this part of the process and uh, that's some units have come to it later than others some have been pressured but yeah. that's acknowledged across the force so i mean a couple things there i mean one you know it's the staff actions in the military decision making process and the operations process kind of writ large is a series of of subordinate drills i mean really when we boil it down and um you know, but with that, as you take the analogy of the squad, and, and uh, unfortunately, I got triggered there. You know, one of the big mistakes that I made as a battalion commander, I, I brought a great team down here. Uh, we did a great rep at LTP, and then in my infinite wisdom, I, I changed a bunch of people out on the staff before the rotation. Uh, what do you see with the way we, we crew our staffs? Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, and it got my perspective is the battalion. So, you know, I've become a Stockholm syndrome yeah. with, with battalion commanders. But, um, you know, I was fortunate to command two battalions, and these battalions were incredibly well-resourced. I mean, I had career captains on my staff waiting to take companies that field grades could turn to. They'd been school trained at the career courses. So when you said something like, you know, develop a course of action in their heads, you could see it, you know, agadap dialed up and uh, uh you, we don't see that i mean it, that's i actually have my first career course captain as a staff officer an infantryman uh that i've seen this year yeah what? everyone's else are lieutenants so they're they're not it's not that they're not bright they may be brighter than the rest of us but they don't have the repetitions and they don't have you know the school training similar <coughs> with uh you know field grades who haven't been to ile they just, even people that I can tell are going to go on to be multi-star officers. They're incredibly talented. They haven't had the benefit of being put through the process with their peers. So they gain that greater understanding. Yeah, the reps. What about on the NCO side? I mean, what do you see? Uh, where, where are the, what are some examples of units maybe that have done that well? And oh, I mean, I, that's, that's an easy one. Well. I mean, and it, it varies by unit at the battalion level. They're seat constrained. 
there's only you know based on where they're coming from there's there's some limitations but uh i've had uh i've got an officer major in this battalion he's brand new he's right out of being a company first sergeant i've had guys like that before they they, they come in sir i've never done any of this and you know dot, dot, i said there's no better place to learn i mean classroom environment battle staff obviously teaches it but there's no better place to learn and uh you know those guys that learned that that uh, had this happen with a triple deuce sergeant major here a couple years ago he came back as a command sergeant major in the 101st and he marched in three senior ncos ops nco ops nco you know i mean intel nco ops nco and his s4 nco i see he said sir tell them what you told me and now we're both going to make them do what and I don't make anybody do anything, right. but but I do create an environment where that can happen. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think the units that can do that get those people here. They, they tell me it's of of great benefit. I realize people are constrained out there; they can't afford to to do some of that sometimes. But that's the feedback I get. Right. I mean, I, you know, one of the, you know, what we do is hard. I mean, the operations process is hard. It's complex problem solving under high stress. Uh, no problem in the army uh that's hard um you know gets easier unless you're getting the commission officers involved in like solving it um what what are some best practices uh for battalions uh staffs to to really empower and, and get and get the most out of the non-commission officers yeah one thing we do at ltp and I, i'm speaking for myself here but but i know all the other coaches share this we have a great non-commission officer coach noe salinas um and um so one, like I treat the officer major as the third field grade, you know, in the room. So, you know, all the other NCOs in the room see that and they know that, you know, there, there's an empowerment there. And then I rarely find a field grade who won't utilize a senior NCO. Right. So that, that doesn't become an issue. Um, uh, if they can get here to, to LTP, they're going to get to see what their primary is being held responsible for, even if they're not always together. And oftentimes you're separated from these people based on how we see too. So they get a better understanding of that. Things like peace ops, you know, those can, things can now be scrubbed by the eye of a person who's actually had to go out and do this stuff on a daily basis and we're utilized. So they, they can, they can look at something in a peace op and go that, that that's pretty. That's, but sir, I, you know, this is not going to help out first. Or let me, and the best ones are able to go, and here now, let me show you what would really, you know, help out. And they can do that, uh, you know, by those warfighting functions when they're when they're here. That's where, what I see the best, best battalion staff. Where where do we fail our NCOs? Um, you know, from a staff perspective, in terms of maximizing kind of their talent. Well, I think for CSMs, I, I, I've uh, I've got the opportunity. It's a great opportunity to talk to a lot of former Ranger CSMs, get thrust in battalion CSM job, and that's actually kind of the question, you know, they're asking me is, you know, uh, what do I do in here at LTP? What's going on in this room? They've got a lot of reps doing a lot of very hard things, uh, but how do I position myself? How do I work with the battalion commander? And, you know, where do I input? And part of it is understanding the process. And that's a frustration I'll see from a lot of NCO. They don't understand where we're at in the process, so they'll go out, or a staff officer, oh, you're late, you know, you should have done this back then. And they're coming to me like, when did that, that actually went up? <clears throat> and so if they can understand the process, what we're trying to do by step in MDMP, then they're able to weigh in at a time where, that experience yeah. come to bear. I mean, at the end of war gaming, when you're done, you know, walking in and saying this is all screwed up, it, it's you know, you're not you know, anybody does that. Right uh, now, you're in this dilemma, and uh, yeah. they understand the process. Though that's when you see them coming in, grabbing staff officers, you know, working you know, with their counterpart to maximize their experience. My ops sergeant major when I was a battalion, or, or our battalion's ops sergeant major when I was a battalion commander, joined us after LTP. And, you know, halfway through our rotation, I realized I hadn't explained to him what we were doing, you know, what, how the staff processes, our PSOP, these things, and, and uh, our TOXOP. <clears throat> and, you know, it felt like it was like one of those moments, like, man, I really screwed this yeah. up. No. Because, uh, you know, he had taken kind of all this on and, and felt a deep responsibility to the battalion and the team, and he felt like he was letting the team down. And, you know, uh, I think sometimes the fault that we make and uh, your perspective is, um, 
we have a tendency to assume that, well, this, you know, this person's a star major, this person's an E8, of course they know this. Maybe they don't. It doesn't mean they're not smart. They just haven't been exposed to it. You know, yeah. uh, probably a bunch of great, you know, Ranger uh, senior non-commissioned officers that haven't actually spent a ton of time on the baton staff. And I guess that's a great advantage you have as an LTK. That's, I mean, you know, you know, uh, some may question why we have retired contractors doing this, but they'll they'll walk in and have these kind of conversations with you. Yeah, I, I get all that stuff you're talking about. I, I, what what did you mean by that, or what? And um, so I, no, LTP I, really is a safe space, I, like I, developmentally. I hate to say that. that sounds uh, uh, contrived, but uh, I get a lot of those type of questions, and uh, it's one of the reasons I like peace ops. If you have peace ops that battalions are using, you know, you just pull those things out. Hey, look, this is how your battalion is doing this business. Now, of course, battalions show up with peace ops they don't look at. That that right. that happens, but that's that's rarer now. So. Um, what, what are some examples of, you know, in indicators of a peace op that's going to be effective and actually going to get used? I mean, you, you said the first one, it's not 250 pages long. Yeah, short brevity is the key. And I, I'll often see when I first was working here, you know, I would see our classes, these, these classes we give, which are the same that are taught at career courses. I mean, it's the same information. We just put different lipstick on it. And I would see those packed in peace ops, and I was just, I was kind of confused. I'm like, why is that in here? I mean, well, it's a great class, Coach. I said, I, you know, I don't remember having a lot of time to give classes in that kind of environment. So small is best. Uh, based on fighting products, what are the things we want to hand company commanders? And what are the things that battalion commanders absolutely need to see and use to make the decisions required of them in the planning process? If your peace op is based on and then analog, it's the earlier point, build it analog first, and then whatever widget you've been given or used or gizmo that helps you do something, then then take that and use that gizmo to apply it. Um, that that's all great, but we tend to we have this tendency to think gizmos are the answer that they're somehow they're going to relieve us of, their, of these responsibilities, and I just. Uh, uh, I don't go out in the box, but it's yeah. constant feedback that I get. So to me, if your peace ops are that, and then in the end, your people on your staff and, you know, from duties and response, if everybody knows who's responsible for producing what, you know, you got a much better chance. Um, you know, so let, let's talk a little bit about the fighting products, because ultimately the, the war fighting products are the output from course of action analysis, wargaming. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think what, what I've seen <clears throat> is if we don't know what those outputs are, maybe our, our course of action analysis I isn't as rigorous as it ought to be, or, or we don't carry it to its logical conclusion. I mean, from your perspective, what are those like kind of mandatory uh, products not not mandatory because you're you're forcing people to do it, but mandatory because that, that's that's the minimum that we need to be able to fight the battalion. Yeah. I, I would argue at first and foremost, <coughs> most battalion commanders. This is what they tell me at the end of the rotation, uh, regardless of how they started. That graphics are the single most important of the fighting products. I mean, if it's not going up, if we're not looking at it all the time, there's all different kinds of techniques uh, to do it. But graphics are the single most important yeah. uh, fighting product. Uh, units are looking for some type of uh, brief uh, matrix type uh, order. Uh, okay. Some use different forms of it. Uh, there's usually a fires product. I see different targetless worksheet based on battalion commander style, fire support execution matrix. Uh, usually it's a debate in the practice order, and we produce them all. And then we kind of ruthlessly triage to go, if we can only do one, which is it? And right. when they move into the second stage of the order, and then they'll go out in the box. Um, the sync matrix is the one that gets debated the most. Yeah. Uh, the sync matrix and different units approach it differently. Almost all battalion commanders want to have it in some form. Um, oftentimes, the feedback from the box is company commanders don't look at it. And this is from the OCTs. Yeah. And so you're in, but this was the juice work to squeeze. The battalion commanders think it wasn't. And, and the feedback I've gotten is we can, you know, we need to train company commanders to use this. Well, the first time you're showing it to them in the boxes, if that's the first time you're showing it to them, well, then right. that's... They may not recognize the value. They don't, they don't know the value. So I can't say, um, you know, that where that should be. 
in that pecking order. And then there's usually some, in different units opposed to some wrap around sustainment, Kazavac oriented type overlay or uh, matrix. Now some of that can be in a sync matrix, but but you know usually the sustainment people have that. There's a lot of other things that pop up that are used kind of off and on, but those are consistently the ones that I see. And the key thing is, does, does everybody know what their input to that? Like everybody produces some form of a task organization. It's, you know, it's assets available early on in the process, but in the end it becomes, you know, a task org. Is that a fighting product or not? How is that replicated in your sync matrix or execution <coughs> order or however you do it? You know, but almost everybody knows if you don't have that up as a constant point of reference, you're going to lose track of, of your formation. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> the time constraints that we sort of talk about, um, you know, the days of the 50-page the Word document <clears throat> with the 60 PowerPoint slides accompanying are, are, are long, long gone, and, and as they should be. Um, you know, I'd submit, you know, the graphics and execution matrix at the battalion level um, many of the the other things can be put into those two products um, at the battalion level because the scale and scope is manageable. Um, those are got to be the minimum that we're we're walking out of mm -hmm. war game with. Um, and I would argue that if you have good graphics and you have an X mat and it, every it has them at the order, we can issue the order off those products. Um, we can issue a verbal order. You know, if we've you know the inputs for the for the war gaming, we've got a Maku, we've got an, uh, a, uh, an event temp, the two can brief uh, the situation off that and we can brief the order kind of off that. And I think that that's sometimes, um, you know, orders production is needs to be ongoing throughout uh, the process because uh, we don't have time to be like, okay, now we've done all this. Right. Let's like that's again, that's what you see <coughs> the clients come to. Yeah. First of all, they'll recognize. First of all, there, there's there's fighting products. These are things that we can hand company commanders. Everybody's executing, but usually, and that's the big question about it, the sync matrix. Is it the fighting product or is it the one we have to battle track and attack? Yeah. I'll listen. I mean, you know, y'all are y'all have to figure that out. Uh, but a lot of things are are situ are conditional, as you and I were discussing earlier. Become conditional. I mean, do you really need an execution checklist for every operation you do? I mean, I don't know if you're doing an air assault or an airborne operation. Pro probably. Yeah, right. probably are. Yeah, and that yeah. becomes a synchronization of drill vertically, in the yeah. in the in the brigade. You know, because and that's something you can copy paste. You know, hand a company. I mean, those are things. So I'd argue those are the conditional ones. That as you look at your specific situation, then you okay. Okay, we need this specifically to do this, and then you reverse engineer your way back into, you know, the MDMP process. You know, how can we make our staff estimates? Uh, the former Task Force Three senior had it, and I think they teach it at Leavenworth how to make the um, mission command estimate, largely the responsibility of the S6, or that's a staff officer did it, make that look like the inputs for the war game. Right. Matrix with the efficiencies. Yeah, and across. So, <clears throat> so now you're working off, you know, you're not throwing things away, recreating products, you're trying to work off the same sheet of music. And I see that very frequently. Um, but we do have some very, I mean, we have battalion commanders that, you know, for all that people think that battalion commanders are all kind of lockstep, they only think one way, some things communicate better to battalion commanders than others. Macus, uh, which traditionally work well for guys who have some heavy experience, have been out, they've been mobile, you know, a lot of a light infantry based guys want to get a 1 to 25 map out. It's not that they're not. You know, they want to look at, you know, specific areas of the objective. They just want to blow that up and draw those things on, you know, themselves. So the staff will do a one over the world, Maku, but then they'll neck down. For the objective area. For the objective area. You know, I've seen a lot of variants in those in all battalion commanders. Some battalion commanders have to see an event temp, like you were talking about earlier in the day. Others, you know, want to see kill cards. Yeah. They get that part of the brief when it's brief, but they're, they're going to want that output. They're going to want those, yeah. that kill chart with them. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, I think for commanders and staffs, I mean, I think the danger is, is like this may be useful for the commander, but what do we need to continue planning? Right. And, you know, the event temp is a great example. Like we, we really can't do the planning without an event temp. Right. Um, 
may not be useful for the commander in execution to visualize that or maybe less useful, uh, but we can't complete the planning kind of without it. Right. And of course, this commander that it was Rex Horry yeah. in Triple Deuce. I mean, he knew this process. I was really hoping he was going to come back to be a task force senior. I mean, he had, to, but he could see beyond that because right. it, it was just where it was. But his staff produced all those things, and his right. dude was smart. He's only a first lieutenant because I'm gonna have that event temp. But that was how Rex visualized the enemy once he got through the process. We're all, you know, we're all a little bit there's so there's some. But to me, that's the great thing about the doctrine. It doesn't ever tell you, you know, you have to. But it says you might. Well, it's what it's really trying to tell you. Is, you might want to think about these things because they work. Yeah, and, you know, I think one of the things, and I, I certainly fell victim to this as a battalion commander, is um, it's not enough to have the battalion commander understand what's happening. Uh, it, it's, you know, my, my kind of evolution was, uh, and I was really watching as a task force senior, and... and <laughs> being punched in the face multiple times here in rotation was if if the captains if the battle ncos don't understand it if we haven't if in the planning process mm -hmm. we haven't generated that shared understanding that that permeates to within the staff uh, we're making it really hard for them to help uh visualize you know what we're doing and um you know sometimes i, I found myself like hey i don't need that I, I maybe didn't. You may know when I need it. Right. Yeah, but they need but the, it. But the captain needs it. And that's what the good staffs, you know, that show up already with a piece hop and an idea about fighting products. Right. And they're, they're, the list is always, you know, I look at it and go, well, you'll never get all those things done. But at least you've got a start point. Right. And it leads to this kind of ruthless prioritization about, okay, what do I really want to hand my company commanders and first sergeants that they can use? And then what do we need as a staff? The, the best execution matrix that I've seen was, we, we were talking about him yesterday, was uh, General Jaffers uh, when he was a brigade commander mm -hmm. at NTC. And I, I absolutely shamelessly <laughs> like stole it. Um, and it used intent graphics mm -hmm. um, in the X mat. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was really helpful, especially at night, um, to be able to understand in space and time like what we were doing. Um, and it had the benefit of not being an eight point font, right. um, trying to, trying to visualize what we're doing. And I, that's the tool I, that version of that tool, I, I think is the thing that, you know, company commanders is probably useful for them to keep, keep track of the plot, uh, in the fight, uh, of what's happening in space and time. Yeah. This brigade that we're working with now, they, they, they under Andy Saslov, you know, a former, Roger. you know, cog, I know they've worked hard on that. So I'm, I'm actually anxious and this rotation. Teddy Kleisner after, yeah, was a, yeah. a, you know, I think a disciple of the same kind of, so I've, I've seen that and, and I look forward <coughs> to, uh, they printed me out the piece. They showed up there, they know how to feed the coach. You know, they gave me a copy of their piece up right up front. So, you know, peace ops, I mean, the other and Colonel Saslov and I were talking about this one is like, it, it's, it's decidedly, you know, and to your point, it's decidedly unhelpful when it's a copy and paste out of doctrine kind of into it. If it hasn't been yeah. specificity tailored to the practical things that the unit needs, you know, so the, the peace op that, that actually spells out what the tools are right. for, for course of action analysis is, is hugely helpful because I think we give that to an OPSAR major and all of a sudden, like, people show up with the right tools for right. No, I, I completely concur. And it goes back to my <coughs> comment about, I mean, I, I, should there be a couple of doctrinal checklists in there? You know, of course. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'll have people show up, pull out their staff battle books, you know, lightning press. We reprint a si similar thing and hand them out. I know, I had one for years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the idea that, you know, you're going to go back to that once you're engaged, you know, I just, uh, so to me, peace ops, if they're stripped down to that stuff, to the bare minimum, have a much you know more likely chance of being used now. And I'm not trying to uh, argue that peace ops are some sort of bible. They're they're, they're a, I would argue they're unnecessary, but not sufficient. Um, you know, right. you, you need to have a, 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 from the planning perspective at LTP, the battalions that have them and use them are more efficient right. with what they're doing. Uh, but it can't doesn't guarantee you a good plan. Right. Uh, if you don't right. look at it, it's just more weight you're carrying around. Right. But that is an observation, and that's actually been consistent over my, you know, literally nine years. Battalions that have peace ops and use them are more time efficient than those are not. I, you know, I think the other part with it is, um, you know, how we communicate. 
with our our staffs um you know as commanders and and um i think the peace op you know is a distilling in many ways of doctrine it helps us communicate more clearly um it becomes bre- you know in some respects things become brevity codes for what we're trying to do um you know one of the things i learned and i try to do better in brigade command was was communicate in the language of the peace op communicate in um you know referring to the peace op as i gave guidance because you know i had great captains that had read it and and were trying to use it and follow it and so if i gave commander's guidance using it it made it frankly it made it more likely that what i was trying to communicate was actually received um you know uh, uh, no captain is like you know waking up and be like i wonder how i can stick it to my battalion today right (laughs) Right? up this morning say how can i make my battalion commander pay i mean i got a yeah. i got a kurt smith war story if you I, i'm always in for a now, kurt obviously smith i was war driving story. over here and what are we listening to on the radio you know the israelis are facing an incredibly difficult situation in gaza uh, you know uh, what how many two million people right um uh, you know two dc equivalents of uh i've only done one hostage rescue type event in in my military career and i don't pretend to have any particular expertise in it but you know i was in my third year of battalion command during the invasion of iraq when i got told okay i'm going to play a part in in something like that i was out with one company kurt smith was my as3 right. assistant s3 kurt smith for those of you who don't know him a, a great soldier a uh, former uh, operator in a special mission unit uh, was a commissioned captain as my as3 went on to be Commanded 2506, I think. Right. And then we served together. He was Dragon 7 at National Tran- right. Tarantula and Dragon. Yeah. Out we'll never Tarantula. tell these kind of things in any kind of podcast because of his personality. Right. <laughs> but uh, these are true, and he can uh, he can dial in at any moment. But uh, So I find this out. I'm with a company. My S3 is in the air. No S3 wants to be behind his commander. We need <laughs> another company. So he is out of the loop. But I had a phenomenal XO. Uh, then Major, now retired Major General Dan Walrath, back with my staff in a hard stand. And I find out I'm going to do this. And uh, as I'm sitting there, and the, my commander at the time fragged me over SATCOM and he said, we're going to come back up in 30 minutes and we'll, we'll hear your initial guidance, <laughs> initial planning guidance. And Kurt reaches into his pocket and pulls out the commander's planning guidance worksheet that was in that battalion's planning SOP. And we issued that via SAC. Now, there was not, I mean, I, I, I didn't come up with a Schlieffland plan, <laughs> uh, but there was one element that, uh, that we had known about. All the battalion staff had known it was frustrating. It was about ground versus air infiltration. We struggled with that early on in both Afghanistan and Iraq. And we had struggled with that and been frustrated by it. I know my three would have said, would have screamed it if I didn't mention something about it, but he was stuck in a C-17 at the time. And, uh, you know, I issued that guidance back to my staff, said, look, at this point in time, we will have a ground and air option for this. That was probably the, my only contribution to that to that planning process. Uh, but it was, because, Kurt pulled out the check. Now you're saying it officially. You're communicating to a staff on the other end of a radio. They're looking at the same worksheet. Now, they had the same experience. They probably uh, would have gotten there. Dan yeah. Walrath's 10 times as smart as I ever was. Um, and they knew I was going to take mefloquine on the drive back, which might induce uh, Hall- commander yeah. hallucination. But, you know, it's, it's an example of how these processes, when you're tired, when you're refragged, when you're not at your best, can help you, you know, sink. You know, you either believe that, uh, you either believe awards recommendations that we rose to the occasion, <laughs> that all of a sudden came up with a Schlieffland plan, you know, or you believe we, uh, in adversity, that we dropped to our lowest level of training. Yeah. I, I'm a believer in the second. I, I am too. And, uh, and, you know, it's funny cause, uh, you know, I know Kurt pretty well and, um, you know, as it, you know, one of the biggest things, if you were to ask me about him, is just a very, like one that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, a very standards oriented leader, um, and despite all of his talents and, and intellect and capability, you know, e- even my time with him uh, at National Training Center, I mean, he was one of those guys that, like, okay, like, let's Here's look. the checklist. Here's the checklist. Here's how we do this business. Right. And there's a time for 
you know, thinking, and you know, most of us come to grips with how to do that. But you and, know, it, in, in, in efficiency, um, you know, it, it, it matters for effectiveness because uh, it gives you more time to solve more problems. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, in our business, it's it's an infinite number of of friction that we've got to figure out, and we'll we'll, not, we'll never be able to control all of it. Um, but it gives us you know, that efficiency gives us frankly more swings at, at getting stuff right right and you have people on the other end now that goes back to your your captains i mean you know come back and they're telling you stuff that i mean you know now they're presenting you with with, with options things you need to consider actually, actually asking you harder questions right earlier on than our tendency is to, to, to we tend to discover these things you know in the rehearsal are about to, I didn't sink fires. Now you're on the line of departure. I mean, in this in this day and age, if you if you don't do that, you'll we're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pay for it. You know, uh, you and I were talking, and and uh, you know, I think I think back to you know my my uh, brigade commander uh, in 110 Mountain, uh, General Retired Michael. Um, you know, he talked about his battalion XO when he was a. A lieutenant in 287 and, and a, Mar- a guy named Marty Stanton who I think you know, yeah. you've, you've got some time with too and he, ca- he referred to him as the man with 500 questions you know and that's what he told me as an XO that I ought to be the man with 500 questions um, you know you you can have a lot of experience doing this and um you know what i've found is like you don't really have the answers you do get better at maybe asking the right questions and so you know what you know what have you seen uh with staff officers with xos and threes um kind of their ability to do that and and commanders right well i'll focus on the field grades and and i would argue that's where i spend about probably 50 percent of my time the two field grades and the ops are major for good or bad, they get 50% of Coach Kershaw's time there. Uh, commanders and command star majors, probably about 25 cents, and then probably 25 cents as I bounce between the different war fighting functions on the staff. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, first of all, teamwork. You know, uh, we used to, when I was a field grade, shout out to the Monsignor, Major Mark Fields, a John Hopkins graduate. He coined this term in First Ranger Battalion called uh, the field grade infallibility theory. You know, it's us against the captains. Okay. So I'm you know, sure the captains feel that way all the I mean, time. The problem is there's captains uh, working on the LTP staff right now who suffered under this regime. But it, but his argument was the field grades have to be in lockstep. We have to know this process because the captains are going to, you know, we don't raise these questions. They are. And so uh, that was the whole idea of a field grade infallibility theory. We have to know the process and understand it and great teamwork you have different talent sets you know i've seen you know the best xo man, man it manages uh manages the time of the staff um the s3 and many times and i was mostly an s3 i didn't get to be a battalion or brigade xo to my detriment uh but you know somebody was shining on me out there and put great xos <laughs> uh, above me to, to to do all those things uh, because the s3s can be episodic participants in this process in many ways as the commander is once operations start so people like as3s op sergeant major they have to be e- equally comfortable working for both those people regardless of what rating schemes say good teams of field grades that's what happens the AS3 turns to this guy during this part, that guy during the other part, and, and you see that. Where you have those frictions, it becomes, it can become, you can create difficulties for yourself, kind of like your example about the six things we did to ourselves that actually Geronimo hasn't even done anything. Right. Um, school training, for, yeah, it's, I, I, I see uh, the value of places like ILE here that maybe I didn't realize when I went through CGSC, it's just because me and most of my peers did. Um, what we're teaching in our schools, at least for the career course and ILE, I mean, that's what we're doing here. And the majors and captains that know these things, they're really leading LTP. They're leading the MDMP process. They're doing the hard work, coming up with the COAs, managing the staff, managing time. All for a lot of different techniques. Uh, most XOs know that, managing the time is their first and foremost. That's usually what gets away from us and it's not a conspiracy it's really everybody trying to do their best there just has to be a cutoff and if you can present that to a commander in terms of risk sir this is what we've got for you right now this is what we don't have most commanders are hardwired for that because they've held these jobs 
then they understand that. It's when we have a hard time getting those things in front of them and putting it in those terms. We didn't really understand what he meant by, I want to see a Maku. Well, I really didn't. I wanted to see kind of a Maku, but I really wanted to see the objective out to this many meters covering these routes. That's where we tend to lose time and efficiency. And of course, that's where, that's the learning you see that goes on Yeah, TP. I think the, uh, <clears throat> you know, back to the drill, it, it, it's the practice that we get doing it is what lets us understand they close those gaps to you know the 10th time we're doing it when we when the boss says hey i want a maku okay we start with the objective area first and then we flesh out like the part that we need because we know exactly what he means because we've practiced it you know we we know those kind of things through through repetition and i think the other is you know, you know, Joel Gardner says this all the time. I've heard this from, a, you know, everybody's, you know, wants to know what the reading list, you know, what are you reading right now? Mm -hmm. uh, I think as a major and a captain, it, it probably should start with FM yeah. uh, more often than not. And um, sometimes we undervalue just we got to dig into doctrine and, and kind of read this yeah. stuff. Um, the schools are only going to help guide you. But, but I would say that about our school systems. I mean, I can say that, and I've said that to the to the reps we've had, um, the reps from level worth and fort many more uh you know what they're teaching those captains and majors that's what we're doing we're not doing something else right so i do find that the officers who have been through that they have the framework they did it with different people it was mostly with your peers you had an experienced person leading it but uh, those tend to be the ones that, that are the most efficient uh, you know, the thing we still struggle with, and we talked about this earlier, but, you know, fires, I see much more awareness of that. So it's not like commanders know they got to kill people with fires. You know, as a lieutenant, I was taught in the 101st, you know, you make contact with small arms, you gain freedom of maneuver with belt-fed weapons, but you kill the enemy with fires. Mortars and just work your way up. And we considered attack helicopters back then fires, uh, but mortars, tubed artillery, aerial rocket artillery they called it in the old days and uh you know all the way up to, to close air support and the like so that that is back in the wheelhouse uh but it's the struggle to do that it goes back to this this has always been hard read you know i just recently reread re uh wigley's eisenhower's lieutenants it brought our army to a standstill it's one of the reasons the strategic bombers are being used because we couldn't get enough artillery ammunition we were using it inefficiently we developed the you know the and it became the biggest killer on the battlefield for the american army but it took a lot of work and they made the mistakes that we see at a at a writ large larger level and things like you know ben jackman used to talk about this as the task force three senior you know think about the platoons that are moving and follow and support clearing the mortar firing positions you know if we got the brigades to do that yet the companies need to maneuver i don't know if we're there yet but i know that i hear it at the battalion level now in a, in a way i didn't hear before so i know that battalion commanders know it's a problem uh, i think we have the intellect i, I routinely meet great uh, fire support officers at the battalion level that know what they've got to do uh, but then the th kind of the last component of that that's so hard is well you got to get them the bullets I mean right. those are big bullets the sustainment part the sustainment piece of it and I know you really don't get the workout on it at LTP because we're really just planning they start to think about it but I know y'all are yeah, you know, I mean, my, you know, for folks listening, I mean, my advice is like, you know, number one is understand the scale and scope of, of what we're talking about, right? And I didn't as a battalion commander, uh, you know, I very candid about it. I go out to the National Training Center and, you know, I'd been to the Joint Fires course. Uh, I'd had a mortar platoon attached to me in Iraq. I, I shot a lot of mortar ammo mm -hmm. in Iraq and, you know, and I thought I understood it. And then I went out to National Training Center after some frustrations in my rotation as a battalion commander, and I realized like I was the problem. <laughs> you know, I wasn't treating uh, brigade priority targets like an like an essential task. Um, I wasn't um, maneuvering to get observers in the right spot uh, to observe those targets. And it, it was subordinate to what I wanted to do from a maneuver perspective versus what the brigade was telling me. And so I think, you know, 
understanding the scale and scope as we fight a brigade and a division and what that looks like um, and then like less is more and do it really really well yeah I'll, I'll give you two examples in that and I'll come back to the reconnaissance yeah. part later but but I'll just talk about the sustainment uh, part of it and we have a phenomenal fires coach it pains me to say <laughs> uh, coach Bob Morshauser he taught me this from a guy who went to MPOC and for the mortar platoon leader course and claims I can't be taught anything about indirect fire but, <laughs> but FSOs have always it's probably just the FSOs SOs I always have were too polite. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's right, Major General Rafferty. I'm talking about you. Were too polite to tell me, but he said there was an old rule in FSOs. Whatever the maneuver commander plans as the planned target, okay, Browns type of effects, all that mumbo jumbo, you know, whatever we plan, it's only 60% of the requirement. That's always been, that was the old unenforced rule. Right. You need to, so find out what your maneuver commander wants. Give him what he wants, effects, all those things, mass and fire, you know, da-da, that's 60% of your requirement. 30% are targets of opportunity. You can just count on, in other words, that's where we fail, and then they further keep a 10% reserve. That was the, right. my generation of FSOs, that was how they, that was their cheat card. So my generation was about 60%. The best of us were at 60% at planting fires. So if you can start there, it starts giving you a scope and scale at the battalion level, I think, of what now that problem set is of just moving, getting the right things to the guns, where they're going to be, at what time, to do what. Um, and all that's math. It's math. <laughs> And we don't we don't like to do math. No, and and, be honest. Uh, and and you know, and this is um, you know when getting to watch it and kind of getting an education, you know, with it. You know, my expectations were unrealistic as a battalion commander, um, and then you know I think we get there too with um, you know especially as we talk about large scale combat operations, the the volume that's truly required to get the effect that we we need at a decisive point becomes um, constraining on the other things that we think we we want to do right with fires and so you know this focus on a decisive point focus on detail planning to synchronize for that decisive point that's what gives us the chance mm -hmm. and you know if that's when we've done that um, and that's 60 <laughs> percent that, that's it yeah you know that's it um and that's kind of where we're at um you know and i think the you know general donahue was down here and, and talking with the brigade commander and and this appreciation of um how we're maneuvering to clear PAAs, how we're maneuvering at the battalion level to clear mortar firing points um and really thinking through the geometry of that um and then how we sustain it and the, the, the physics of how we sustain that. Um, if, we, if we don't have that homework, then we shouldn't expect to have fires. Right. Um, and we know that the so battalion commander knows these. Yeah. They know this. It's getting it all together. Right. Uh, just uh, battalion, talking to a battalion commander recently. He's a repeat offender here. Um, even the trigger. I mean, we're asking them to do a defense. I mean, it, that was difficult when I was a lieutenant and captain. Right. You didn't get to train it that much. The whole idea of triggers, what's the timing on those things, you know, based on the type of energy you're fighting, that can be anywhere from 3.8, I mean, it's just in the amount of time. So you have to, you know, that's where the war game really matters, where it comes home to roost. 100%. And, uh, I'll go back to one other sustainment issue. Yeah. I talk fires. and. Uh, the flip side, though, is I think what we still have a hard time accepting. I mean, if, if artillery kills, you know, it's going to kill us. And I think we still have a hard time. I mean, the battalion commanders and sergeant majors all know this, that we're gonna, we need to plan for casualties. There's still a hesitancy in the young battalion staffs to, to admit we're going to take casualties. And, and I, I'm not trying to be some kind of – I've never taken the kind of casualties that we're going to see in Gaza – or that the Ukrainians and Russians are taking. So right. in many ways, I'm just another one of these talking heads, you know, beating my drum. But I have had to plan for it twice in Desert Storm and the invasion of Iraq. And uh, there, we still have this hesitation. We can't get our head around. We're, we want to kill everybody with fires, but inevitably we're going to have to face some of that stuff. And I, I have been pinned down by artillery, albeit briefly. It's not a pleasant experience. No. And... Uh, Again, I don't want to compare it to those. Right. But if you if you have a plane, but it's a window. 
Yeah. If you have a plan, you, you, there's there's a degree of confidence uh, that, that comes from having solid plans, and I think there's still a reluctance. We don't want to stand up in front of a battalion staff and mission analysis, sir, we estimate this many casualties. It's tough. And battalion commanders and sergeant majors have to really, and the best do. Yeah. But the young staffs are hesitant to, to raise that, to do that. And it's, and it's math. It's, it's correlation of forces. It, it just is. Um, you know, the, you and I talked yesterday. I mean, the, the uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the, uh, I think a very accessible uh, historical example is to Paris fight at Goose Green in the Falklands campaign. Um, you know, it's not um, overwhelming casualties. It's significant casualties. Significant casualties. And, and, it's, and it's hard. Um, and, you know, the battalion and, and the brigade have to fight through that uh, problem set um, to, to care for and evacuate those casualties. And so, you know, I think that's a, that's a realistic vignette uh, for our battalions staff to unpack and, and think about and they, they have to get pretty creative in, in how they do the casualty evacuation expeditionary austere against the near peer adversary yeah um, and it, it's a problem we've always faced I mean right. I'm not trying to act like my generation I go back to a vignette uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mack Hayes my second battalion commander in the 101st I was at a night war game second lieutenant's doing company commander stuff and the OC adjudicated you know the naval gunfire landed on my lead platoon of course I'm outraged I'm a typical second lieutenant I'm, me and the other two second lieutenants were trying to gang up on a major. It never works anyway, by the way. They were as tough then as they are now. But but it was interesting. Colonel Hayes was on his way to a football game with his wife. Stopped by to check on us. And he pulled us aside. So what's happened here? And, and uh, well, sir, you know, they say naval gunfire got my lead platoon. And there's three dead and, you know, uh, I don't know, 12 wounded, you know, and... Uh, leading the company, you know, and I'm leading, I'm a playing company commander. He goes, well, Mike, what are you, you going to do? Well, I'm going to attack through, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, and, uh, and you know, with, with that kind of genius that he had, he really, two-time company commander in Vietnam, wow. Silver Star winner. I mean, he, he had, and, but, but a, a, a personable person. He, he, you know, the genius was he flipped it into a teaching moment. And he goes, okay, Mike, those three casualties are, I mean, he knew these people by name in my platoon. Sergeant Lauer, your platoon sergeant, which man, most battalion commanders can get away with. The other one, Sergeant Rock, my lead squad leader, my go-to guy, tailback from Virginia. You know, my go-to guy in, in, in PFC Turner, my RT. I mean, how he was able to do that as a battalion <laughs> Those are your three <laughs> casualties. And now I'm like, go, 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 go. And, you know, Mike, how many men did you come out of the last ex eval with in your platoon? The number was 17. I knew that. So... Those casualties are out of your 17. You just call it three dead and seven wounded out of a 17-man platoon, you know. You're going to continue the attack? Go, 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 go. Took us into a lesson about why you attack in column, the difference between how you can fight over that and, you know, you can do your casualty evacuation, you know, on site, how to maneuver a company. It turned into an OPD. We didn't even know it. We were just sitting there as lieutenants going, what the heck is this guy talking about? Holy, how did he take this thing and turn it on its head with us? The advantage we have in today's army is we actually have a, a, a cadre of battalion commanders who have these type, you know, of experiences. And uh, I think we all need to be on guard about saying Lisco is something completely different. Because never once did he stop and go, you know, this happened in Vietnam. I, I can't really teach y'all how to fight. I think it was an invasion of Cuban scenario right. and stuff like that. And so I think we need to be on guard. We need to try to build on those things that this cohort of battalion commanders has. Right. Uh, I, you know, um, your, uh, your godson, uh, Zach Miller, uh, was a company commander for me. And, you know, one of the things that I came away, and, and, and that's really the cohort of folks that are getting ready to either are in battalion command right. or getting ready to be, um, you know, one of the things I came away with uh, from battalion command is um, the, the maturity and seriousness of, of the folks I had as company commanders, and now many of them are senior majors or getting ready to be battalion commanders, precisely because they had been platoon leaders, they had been company XOs, arguably in some of the hardest days in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, um, yeah, I, th I, I think you're right. I mean, pl playing to the strengths, uh, understanding where there are differences. I think most of the differences are about scale and scope. Right. Um, of, of what we're doing. I think uh, some of it gets to the amount of control required for large-scale combat operations. Uh, but I think the certainly the human dimension of this 
Um, you know, I, you and I had talked to the, uh, you know, I, I'm confident you could take a, a, a rifleman from 1944, time warp them into a, you know, platoon in the Argandab at the Korangal or, or Sadr City, and it, they'd have felt quite at home in an infantry right. squad. Um, that fight has not changed uh, drastically at the squad level. Um, and, and to your point, I think that the impacts of casualties is, is a real thing. Yeah. Um, and like I say, I find that battalion commanders and sergeant majors, they know this. They're trying to get their staffs to do the planning. Right. And But I, it, it's, uh, you know, I get, I'll offer you one other observation. And it was the last brigade that came through here that I yeah. coached. And uh, battalion commander coached. They both happen to be Ranger Regiment guys. But, um, but that's really not the point of this. Um, uh, as brigade commander, we were uh, Coach Lear, who was leading, and just concluded at the, the kind of MDMP champ, champ planning challenges. You know, kind of comes back to mission command at the end, and you know, we were talking about the things we hear and how we can address them here in LTP, given the limits that we're focused on planning. And, and the brigade commander, with a confidence that I know I displayed when I was in that position, or a, a Ranger battalion commander at least before the invasion, as people were throwing up potential pitfalls we could face. So I w we'll be able to work through that with our mission command systems. And it, it just, you know, my hair went up on the back. I said, I, you know, I'll pull them aside. And I pulled those two commanders aside because he I'd heard my battalion commander say the same thing. And, I, and the, the things that the battalion commanders to me, to me struggle with are those things we've actually built into them. We've, we've actually trained them not to worry about. And uh, both in uh, the invasion of uh, Iraq, and in Desert Storm, we had just been fielded new types of mission command systems, which were great advances from what we had had previously. And in our adopting, trying to get the most out of them, which is what those guys are getting paid to do. I would never tell them not to do that, but we built in vulnerabilities. We started blabbing on Singar's radios when we were frequency hopping. Now, they may not know what you're saying, but they know what net you're on. And we got jammed off. Crossing through the breach in Desert Storm the first night, they jammed us off our tank battalion net because we were not being judicious. Radio discipline that we had learned as lieutenants, we threw away when we right. got in these nice, with these new high-speed comms. And it caused, we were fortunate not to have fratricide. I had more holes in the back of my Bradley in Desert Storm than I had in front. We were very fortunate not to have fratricide. And we weren't fighting an enemy that could make us. He could jam us off our net, but he couldn't make us pay. We had similar, Dan Walrath wrote a, a, a portion about that during the invasion of Iraq. We had thought we had mastered digital planning and had systems that could overcome these things, and they collapsed. If you don't have these things to go back in your muscle memory, uh, you know, we weren't facing opponents that could stop us. Right. So we took casualties, inflicted casualties on ourselves that were regrettable, but were considered acceptable but i can't guarantee y'all is that y'all are going to face that you know be careful of the things that in your quest to get better you don't create you don't create these vulnerabilities vulnerabilities that you're really yeah. doing to yourself i mean joe rainey at the maneuver conference you know he said you know technology is going to punish uh unskilled commander and untrained units and technology in the hands of skilled commanders and trained units is going to give them an outsized advantage and i think that that's like as a healthy way to think about you know technology we don't need any luddites yeah um, but you know, the things that have worked are they're, they're probably they're probably good lessons, you know. Radio discipline is just a good habit to have, period. <laughs> uh, and it, it will will pay, you know, kind of with mediums uh, going forward. All right, sir. Um, so we'll probably get the chance to do this again at a later time between the two ferns, as you like to say. Um, I'll, uh, you know, I'll give you sort of the the closing comments. I mean, what advice? you know, would you give leaders as, as they're helping prepare their teams um, for, for LTP or, or, or for, you know, what what may come uh, tomorrow uh, in this uncertain world? Yeah, we thanks, live. Matt. And first of all, before I close with, you know, profound comments, I want to thank <laughs> you for the opportunity to do this. This is something I care about a lot. And, and I would I would say I do speak for the other coaches at, NT, uh, at LTP. That's a dangerous thing. But Actually, I got a bunch of friends doing this out at, at NTC. Well, the, the people that are coaching you, we're doing this because we want to do it. 
and and we think we can help. We may or may not do that, but I, I can say that the group of professionals that I work with here at, at LTP are all committed to, to, to help make the units uh, better. And then the last thing I do want to put in a plug for Task Force 3, you know, my OCT team. Uh, I get uh, the, the amount, the, the feedback I get from them for these things that I work on in planning. Of course, I talk to every battalion commander after he comes out of the box. Most send me written comments back. But the feedback I get, the work that the OCTs are doing in the box, uh, and I was never an OCT, but it's, it has incalculable value to our army. They just see it every day. And um, so those two groups of people I'm proud to be working with and associated with here. Uh, the last thing I'll leave, you know, is field grades are prepare, preparing. Uh, I, I've been faced with a handful of very difficult situations in my career. Most were not. It could be figured out by average people. But the thing that I observed, and I've worked for some great commanders and uh, had great people under me, but when you're in a very tough situation, you want options. You want options. MDMP is trying to help you with that, not not constrain you to it. Now, we often constrain ourselves. So uh, as you think about, like, you know, there's Israeli platoon leaders, company commanders, battalion commanders, you know, Ukrainian, same same level. They're, you know, when you're in a tough fight with somebody who can inflict casualties, stop you from doing your business, you're going to want options. How do we get the most out of planning? So that were not left. And I, I used to, and I didn't make this up, I got it from, from others. Most commanders looked at three things and then a fourth. You know, the first thing is always fires. Fires are inherently mobile for an infantryman. They're one radio away call, you know, or yelling at Captain Rafferty to get me some, <laughs> you know, what kind of fires. Uh, two, a reserve. Actually, this generation is better because they've had so many tests of this downrange. When, when I was a field grade, we routinely blew off reserves. They're not getting trained. Why do we care about them? We hadn't faced this. So I'd argue that they know this. Uh, you know, how do you have a reserve? Are they positioned? Have you planned to employ them? Uh, and then leader presence in the battalion and brigade committee. You're no longer, I got it. There's nothing better for dead, for good morale in a unit, as the British used to say, than a dead officer. But that probably shouldn't be our first course of action. Right. So where you place your key leaders in your formation at the battalion and brigade level, uh, as you think through, to think through mission command is in Cal, because the last thing you're gonna ask for, and, and those Israeli commanders are pondering it right now, I'm gonna have to ask guys to get killed. Uh, that's this business. Um, you can have your own set of criteria, you know, but arguably in our army, you know, asking your soldiers to die because I, I didn't think this through, that should be the last option. Uh, so whatever your criteria for, however you think about fighting, have a way to think about it. Kurt Smith, a guy yeah. who had more time getting shot at than I've ever thought about. If that guy can pull out a checklist. That's good enough for the rest of good us. Good enough for the rest of us. <laughs> so think through what your checklist is. For the field grades, how does your commander think about this? Do I understand it? And how do I help my staff understand about how my commander thinks about that? And then if he takes one between the running lights, <laughs> step up, use his, or come up with your own. Come up with your own. Well, sir, uh, always great to talk with you. You know, I think back to, you know, probably one of our first conversations, I think, in D.C., talking about the Iraq War. Uh, you know, I think you were one of the few, you know, 210 Mountain, the commando is one of the few Army units, maybe the only Army unit to ever receive a peace award, which I think is a, a pretty impressive. And, um, you know, you know, kn knowing you by reputation and then getting to know you, um, sir, uh, honored to get to serve alongside you. And uh, thanks so much for what you do, making a difference in our Army, making a difference for me personally. So thanks Thank all the you, way. Matt. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you for joining us on The Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. 
Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e forward slash j-r-t-c. We'd like to thank our partners at the Center for Army Lessons Learned of the Combined Arms Center, especially the JRTC Call Observations Detachment. Be sure to follow them on social media as well. Follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www.army.mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts, and be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC Experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.